Once again, this morning I had the opportunity of listening to an Islamic presentation while I was riding. Ironically, what I listened to was a video. Uh, a friend of mine from Liberty University, not who you're thinking, uh, converted uh, one of Abdullah of London's videos uh, into MP3 format. And since Abdullah uses a lot of text on the screen, he actually took the time to read what was on the screen so that once again I could use the many hours that I spend uh, road riding uh, as a uh, time of study. And it is an excellent time of study indeed. Anyway, uh, as I listened to it, I once again was just uh, so struck with the difference between the approach uh, that uh, we at Alpha and Omega Ministries attempt to take in speaking the truth in love and in showing honor uh, to those even with whom we disagree uh, by speaking the truth, by being consistent, by being accurate, by at least striving for it. Uh, we may not be perfect, we are fallen human beings and we have our biases and prejudices too, uh, and sometimes we just get our facts wrong, but we try, we seek uh, to utilize the best information that we can find, things like that. Well, as I was listening, the subject of the Council of Nicaea came up, and a number of years ago I wrote an article for the CRI Journal, What Really Happened at the Council of Nicaea. And I have heard many Muslims uh, come up with just uh, amazing assertions about what allegedly took place at the Council of Nicaea. Now, back on June 19th on my blog, uh, one of my fellow bloggers, a uh, Turretin fan, uh, wrote an article about this very uh, video that I'm going to be responding to here and showing you a major portion of. And so if you'd like to have a written response, you can go to the June 19th entry uh, on the Prosopologian blog at aomin.org and then you'll have the quotations and citations that are found there. Uh, and in fact, on some issues, might go into more depth than I will in this video response. Uh, but I want to play uh, a major portion of what was presented. Uh, there is one portion here, unfortunately. Uh, well, the, the entire video is, is filled with mockery. And so I apologize to my Christian friends who might be offended by what they see but I think it, it helps to recognize that uh, when it's really untruth, it's, it's untrue, it doesn't have any validity to it, uh, that, um, that, that makes it a little bit easier to watch. Uh, but again, I, I don't think this is how uh, we should approach interfaith dialogue to begin with. Uh, and I, I would hope for better from uh, Abdullah and his uh, friends Isa and others that are involved with him. So I want to play a section uh, and then uh, I will start to respond uh, back and forth uh, as, uh, as I present this video. By the fourth century it became necessary for the church to decide which of the many gospels that are in circulation were to be accepted as authentic. The question came up during the famous Council of Nicaea. I've said it before, I'll have to say it again, the Council of Nicaea did not address the issue of the canon of the scripture. There is not a single shred of contemporary or meaningful historical information to substantiate the assertion that the Council of Nicaea addressed the issue of the canon. None. Zero. Zip and zilch. The only sources that these gentlemen are going to use, they stole from the theosophists of the 19th century. They do not use any contemporary historical information. They don't quote Eusebius. They don't quote anyone that has any meaningful connection to the Council of Nicaea whatsoever. If we treated the Islamic sources the way that Abdullah of London and Isa and his friends address the Council of Nicaea here, they would have every good reason to reject everything we have to say concerning their religion. So why do they feel that they have the right to engage in this kind of activity. I cannot begin to understand it, but once again I call upon Abdullah come up to a higher standard. Pull this kind of information. 
it is just so bad, it's just so wrong, historically speaking, that anyone who says they honor the truth should not engage in this kind of rhetoric. The Council of Nicaea was convened around 325 AD to settle the growing dispute about the nature of Jesus. The Roman Emperor Constantine conveyed this council to solve a problem that was threatening to rip Christianity apart. Although the Emperor was pagan, he needed a new gimmick to unite the Roman Empire from being fractured and from splintering apart. Christianity seemed to be the ideal solution. But the, the only problem was that Christianity in its pure monotheistic form was totally different to pagan Roman religions that the citizens of Rome were used to. So it was in his interests to foresee um, the creation of a more Romanized um, Christianity that would appeal to Roman citizens and at the same time unite them behind one common religion and would unite them politically in one common identity. A few bishops and a significant majority of the Christian public believed Jesus to be purely human and a prophet of God. Okay, a couple problems with this. Uh, there's no question about the political motivations of Constantine at this point. Uh, but the idea that he wanted to somehow change Christianity is a far leap uh, from the recognition of the uh, political nature of the beast. The idea that he wanted to create some new Christianity uh, is, again, pure speculation without any type of meaningful historical foundation. Uh, beyond this, we are just now told that some bishops and the majority of the people believe Jesus was merely a human prophet. Um, this is pure absurdity. Um, not even the Arians believe that. Uh, the Arians believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Uh, they believe that he was divine, uh, but they differentiated between Jesus and God on the level of being uh, in the sense of denying that his divinity was uh, uh, of the same nature as the Father's. He is a great creation and a divine being in that sense. He is not a mere Razul. This is pure Islamic wishful thinking read back into the history without the slightest bit of concern for context or truthfulness. I would challenge Abdullah and his friends, document this. Show it to us. Uh, it's interesting, just recently, uh, a uh, uh, fresco was discovered, a mosaic was discovered in Megiddo. Uh, it may be one of the earliest Christian churches founded long before the Council of Nicaea. And on the floor, you have the specific reference to Jesus Christ as God in the exact same words uh, that Ignatius uses in his epistles back in 107 AD. Uh, so the idea that the, this was a minority viewpoint or something like that, uh, again, pure wishful thinking stands completely against uh, all of the documentation that serious individuals uh, would be taking into account if they were seriously trying to address the subject of early Christian belief. But the other bishops, like Anthanasius, believe Jesus was divine. Simple factual error. Athanasius was not a bishop at the Council of Nicaea. Uh, Alexander of Alexandria was the bishop that represented Alexandria at the Council of Nicaea. Athanasius was there, but he was merely a deacon. He was an assistant uh, to Alexander. And it is pure supposition as to what Athanasius' role at the council actually was. There's no real evidence, uh, contemporaneous evidence, uh, of him taking a leading position or anything like that. Uh, but factual error here, Athanasius was not a bishop at the time of the Council of Nicaea. Fortunately, the two testimonies of eyewitnesses of the event have been preserved so there can be little doubt as to the method used during that event in the selection of the Gospels. There were 318 bishops present in this council, and one of the two eyewitnesses, Sabinus, Bishop of Heraclea, left a description of their mental capabilities. With the exception of the Emperor and Eusebius Paphilus, these bishops 
were a set of illiterate, simple creatures who understood nothing. Yet, it was this council of illiterate, simple-minded creatures who decided the fate of Christian doctrine for the next 1,700 years, and in the end they submitted the issue of Jesus' divinity to a vote. After much pressuring from Antanasius, the pro-divinity group won by majority vote. Once again, pure historical fiction uh, being presented as if it was fact. Once again, uh, there is no contemporaneous evidence that Athanasius was putting pressure on uh, anyone at all. Uh, Sabinus was, there's no evidence, Sabinus was an eyewitness. In fact, uh, if some of the uh, information is correct, he flourished around 425, which would mean he was uh, uh, maybe a baby uh, at that point in time at best. Um, uh, his writings are from 375, uh, so there is no evidence that he actually was uh, at, at all at the Council of Nicaea. He was not an eyewitness. Uh, if you think he was, prove it. And furthermore, uh, even his very biased history uh, that comes from many years after the Council uh, was criticized heavily at the time that it was actually written uh, by his contemporary contemporaries because of its bias and its inaccuracy. And so to take uh, his uh, dislike of these council fathers and to expand that into some kind of an established uh, demonstration uh, that everyone at the Council of Nicaea were a bunch of illiterates uh, is again not only uh, ridiculous but it's also extremely offensive. Uh, if someone did this about the companions of Muhammad, uh, people would be dying in the streets. Uh, but Muslims seem to be able to use singular sources, ignore the contemporaneous sources, and think they can get away with it. Uh, the reality is that many of these bishops uh, came to the Council of Nicaea bearing the scars that they had earned as people who had suffered for the name of Christ. Because serious students of history, those who actually are concerned about truth, know the fact that uh, that uh, it had only been 12 years since the peace of the church in 313. Uh, that meant that there had up till 313 been the most severe imperial persecution of Christians. The worst persecution of Christians was at the very end of the period of imperial persecution, beginning with Nero, and then becoming very heavy from 250, 260 until the peace of the church in 313. There were men at that council missing limbs, bearing scars from the torture that they endured for their faith in Christ. The idea that these men were a bunch of illiterates is not only offensive, it's simply foolish. No serious person dealing with truth would make these kinds of statements. What is more, the idea that someone could uh, force upon them a religion that they had never even thought of before, when they would not renounce Christ at the tip of a sword, only 12 or 15 years earlier is likewise utterly absurd. It destroys the credibility of people to use this kind of argumentation. I don't know why they don't see that. It certainly for me convinces me that these individuals are, are, are not trying to convert me. They're not interested in my coming to know anything about Islam because you don't misrepresent someone else's faith and the history of someone else's faith in the process of trying to bring them uh, to the truth. And so these, this kind of, of rhetoric, uh, this kind of mockery which we're about to see, uh, is founded, as we have now seen, upon so much falsehood, so, so, such simple error of fact, again reflects, I think, greatly upon the um, nature of Islamic apologetics today.
Once again, I apologize for that, but I think we need to understand uh, exactly how Muslims think the deity of Christ uh, is defined and defended. Uh, I've, I've written an entire book on the doctrine of the Trinity, presented uh, a great deal of biblical evidence on that particular subject, have defended that a number of times, of course, and so a serious Christian looks at this and is simply offended, doesn't want anything to do with, this is Islam, I don't want it. Um, and I, again, that makes me wonder why the Muslims produce that kind of stuff. But just another historical fact, there were two of the bishops who didn't sign the creed, and that's not where the belief in the deity of Christ comes from in the first place. Because if these gentlemen would read a, a meaningful history of the Christian faith, they would know that for the next more than 40 years, it was the Arians who held sway in the Roman Empire. Sometime around 350-ish or so, Jerome, looking back at it, made the commentary that the world woke up and was amazed to find itself Arian. Athanasius himself was driven out of his church five times for refusing uh, to give up on his belief in the deity of Christ. This, this thing about Paulians and uh, Pauline Christianity. Again, to the, the serious historian, you, you just go, what, what, what are these people talking about? Um, but Muslims are willing to grab hold of you know, any kind of argumentation. In an earlier part of this video, in an earlier part, a portion of it, a uh, segment, uh, they're, they're citing, and not really understanding what they're saying, but they're citing liberals. Now these same individuals, I'm sure, uh, do not cite uh, Ibn Warwick and uh, atheists or, or liberals who address the subject of the Quran. I, I'm sure that they are not utilizing that kind of information. Once again, the, the, the stark reality that the Muslim wears one garb when speaking of Muhammad and the history of Islam and their sacred text, the Quran, and then tears that garb off and puts on the garb of the ultra-liberal, the atheist, to address the New Testament and the history of Christianity. That epistemological schizophrenia is, to me, the greatest evidence of the error, the falsehood of Islam. I have not met. Not yet. Got a number of debates coming up real soon. Maybe I'll meet one. But I have yet to meet the consistent Muslim. I have yet to meet the Muslim who remains a Muslim when attacking the New Testament. I haven't met one. I'll let you know if I do. Although the main issue was to discuss the nature of Christ, the arguments for and against his divinity were based upon the 40 to 100 or so Gospels that the council members brought with them from their respective areas. 4,200 Gospels. <laughs> I, I, I don't even know how to start to respond to something like this that is just so far removed from reality. Um, there is not a single shred of historical evidence, none whatsoever, nothing that could even begin to substantiate such an absurd statement as this. None. The, the wildest liberal, the, 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 the wildest atheist, can only look at that kind of claim with, with stunned shock. It, 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 is, it, it would be like me saying, well, actually, uh, scholars say that uh, the Quran was written by 3,000 different individuals over the course of 400 years. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, but it is extremely difficult to take someone seriously who will, with a straight face, utter something as absurd as this. Um, and, and you say, well, absurd is a strong word. Well, when you're making things up on the fly, yes, it's a, it's a strong word. Even in just a moment, he's going to say that they, they, they submitted 40 Gospels to the Council. The Council of Nicaea said and did nothing about the canon. There is no evidence for any of this. It's all lies. Prove it. If, show us documentation. Go to meaningful sources. Not theosophists 
who get seances in the 19th century. <laughs> okay, that, that's, that's not history, folks. Prove it. Document it. You know, here. This is called documentation. Here is the text of the earliest New Testament Greek manuscripts. Here you will find the text of each of the papyri manuscripts. This is called documentation. This is the serious stuff. Let me show you something else. I'm not even going to move the camera. Here. This is what's called documentation. Okay? See that? This is a facsimile. Costs hundreds and hundreds of dollars of the earliest manuscripts of the Quran from Paris, from London. This is called getting documentation, doing things seriously, making things up on the fly, finding absurd stuff from somebody on drugs on the internet is not serious discussion about religious issues. It shows no respect, gentlemen, for those you are seeking to try to bring into Islam to post this kind of information. None. There were not 40 Gospels submitted to the Council of Nicaea. They did not bring 4,200 Gospels with them. This is all absurdity on the highest level. And those interested in truth should, if they're consistent, remove this kind of information. Other Muslims who are concerned should write to them and suggest they check their facts. And if they can't back it up, they need to withdraw it. And there's one thing is for certain. That kind of claim is so absurd, it would have to be withdrawn. So the issue over which Gospels are fully authentic and which are not had to be dealt with there and then in order for an agreement to be reached on which is to be used as a source for argumentation. About 40 Gospels were submitted to these bishops in total. As they differed widely in their contents, the decision was very difficult as to which one to choose. At last it was determined to resort to divine intervention. The method used was known as a sortes sanctorum or the holy casting of lots for the purposes of divination. Its use in the Council of Nicaea was described by another eyewitness, Pappus, in his book The Synodicon, to the Council of Nicaea. He says, Having promiscuously put all the Gospels referred to the Council for determination under the communion table in a church, they besought the Lord that the inspired writings might get upon the table while the spurious ones remained underneath and it happened accordingly so then when the church fathers came back the next morning they found four gospels matthew mark luke and john on the table funnily enough no one ever asked if there happened to be a spare key to that chamber but I guess we'll never know. I mean, there has to be some reason those Gospels got on the table. I mean, they couldn't have just teleported there or something. is that the church was practicing divination to pick its word of God and I'm so happy for that reason because I know therefore I can trust it I can trust the 27 books that are there more than that we know that when they were chosen they were chosen for a purpose I trust them I hope you do as well this is Jay history is funny isn't it what Monday Christians swear by testify to and even kill for was in reality just a bunch of books selected using under the table shenanigans which I find that very hypocritical because the church condemned thousands of unfortunate victims as conjurers, enchanters, magicians, 
witches and in league with demons those who practiced divination and burned them by the thousands. Well, you have to give the young men uh, some, some credit for imagination. Uh, but uh, given that they're willing to uh, uh, mock the Christian faith based upon their research, notice that they said there were two eyewitnesses. Seminus, which we've discovered there's no evidence that he was, and that if he was, he would have been like uh, a baby uh, and lived over a hundred. And then we have this Pappus, who gives us this story. Again, by the way, you'll find this in the Theosophist writings of the 19th and 20th centuries, which seems to be exactly where they stole it from. Um, but uh, Pappus is an eyewitness. Well, that's interesting, because if they had taken the time to check their sources, which clearly they did not, they would find out that Pappus's book that they're quoting from actually contains material about uh, numerous councils. In fact, the last council it contains information about was from uh, just before the year 900, which would mean that Pappus would have lived to about 600 years of age. <laughs> uh, that makes about as much sense as my saying John Calvin was there when the Quran was revealed. Yeah, it's about the same uh, problem there. This kind of uh, utter absurdity. Uh, presented as if it's fact, uh, is just simply reprehensible. There, there is no reason to do this kind of thing. I, I certainly hope that Abdullah and Isa and his friends don't really believe this stuff. Do you? I, I, I mean, this is just so fantastic, so ahistorical, so ridiculous, that it's, it's really hard to, to believe that this isn't being presented as a, as a joke, as something that's just uh, meant to, to make us all chuckle. And if that was somewhere on the website, I, I'm sorry if I missed it, but I don't think it's there. I, I think these young men are demonstrating that many Muslims today are willing to grab hold of anything, no matter how outrageous it is, and how completely outside the realm of anything they'd accept about their own religion. I mean, look at what has happened here. This kind of stuff is put on, on YouTube. And, and no one complains. In a debate, I mention an Islamic tradition about Ibn Masud's death uh, by being beaten for not giving up his Quran, and all of a sudden, I'm a terrible, horrible deceiver. You put stuff on YouTube that is absolutely beyond absurd, and all is well. Double standard. Hypocrisy. What does that say about our relative positions? What does that say about truth? I hope you'll think about these things, and I would invite Abdullah and Issa and his friends uh, to withdraw those videos that have been demonstrated to simply be based upon um, pure fiction, absolute fiction that has no connection whatsoever with reality. Thanks for watching.